Open your Bibles first of all this morning to the book of Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. I want to read verse 11. The Apostle Paul is speaking, but I certify you, brethren, <clears throat> excuse me, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Another translation says, no one taught me this revelation. I received it directly from the Lord. What I'm going to share with you this morning, I can say the same words. I'm certainly not trying to compare myself to the Apostle Paul, but I can identify with what he is saying here. What I'm going to introduce to you this morning, and we'll be talking about it again next Sunday, and then there's one more lesson I want to share uh, regarding this message. I received it from the Lord on October the 5th as I was praying about the coming new year. And as most of you know, uh, I set time aside during the month of October to specifically hear what the Lord has on his agenda for the coming new year. How many of you are ready to get into 2023? Well, we're right there on it, praise God. And uh, before I tell you what he said, let's go to the book of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> I received what I'm about to share with you directly by revelation from the Lord. And I believe, praise God, that if we will listen to it carefully, determine that we're going to be doers of the word and not hearers only, then it's going to produce great results in our lives. Amen. Amen. As you know, 2022, we declared by the Spirit of God a year that we were to experience the open hand of God. How many of you can say, I've experienced the open hand of God during 2022? Unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision. That has been our theme, and praise God, God has confirmed it with signs following. And if you haven't experienced it, the year is not up. Hallelujah. In fact, don't even, don't even stop at the end of this year and say, well, you know, I'm moving on to something else now. No, just hang on to it, praise God. God wants you to experience supernatural provision all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. Now, in Mark chapter 10, let's begin reading in verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now remember, this is a rich man. That's the reason he was rich. He observed the commandments. Okay. Verse 20 says, once again, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Now, that's important because a lot of people have the idea that Jesus doesn't love rich people. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, well, he loves me. <laughs> and I may not be rich now, but I plan to be, praise God, amen. amen. Jesus loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, Jesus didn't give that invitation to a lot of people. You won't find that, take up the cross and follow me, spoken by Jesus to very many people. Now, we all are to be followers of Christ, but we're talking about uh, apostleship here. So notice, he says, take up the cross and follow me. So Jesus was endeavoring to offer this man the best deal he'd ever experienced in his entire life. Verse 22 says, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. 
Now, notice it says he went away grieved because he had great possessions. Now, if you study this carefully, you come to realize he, the great possessions actually had him because that's the reason why he couldn't sell and give to the poor. That's how you can tell if you have something or it has you. If you can't give it away, then you don't have it. It has you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Amen. So notice here, he was grieved for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Do not get religious on that verse. It didn't say it's impossible for rich people to come into the kingdom. It said it's hard. And the reason being is because they trust their riches. Amen. They trust their riches. It's hard for them to lay aside their trust in riches and turn their allegiance to God, but not impossible because there are a lot of wealthy people that have turned their allegiance to God. In fact, I know several wealthy people and I've read about several wealthy people who have, who, who've gone on uh, before us that actually dedicated 90% of their income to the gospel. Didn't stop at 10%. They gave 90% of it. Amen. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? So notice he said, it's hard, not impossible, but it's hard. And the disciples were astonished at his words. Now you would think after the disciples heard those words, that it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, the disciples would have jumped up and said, boy, we got it made because we're poor. No, they were astonished at his words. Notice, they were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? There's the point, that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. They were astonished out of measure. Once again, if these guys were so poor, then they would have jumped up and said, we have got it made. Man. But they were astonished out of measure saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Jesus looking upon them saith, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and followed thee. Now remember, Peter was a, a businessman. He was a fisherman by trade. He had a fishing syndicate. And in fact, that day that he decided to turn away from that and to follow Jesus was the best day he'd ever had in the fishing business. Remember, caught boat sinking, net breaking, loads of fish, and he walked away from it. So this is not a poor man talking here. He says, we've left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, with persecutions, with persecutions, Oh, I wish you'd have left that part out. <laughs> Nobody persecuted me when I had nothing. <laughs> With persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Okay. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Now notice here, Jesus said that anyone who has left anything for his sake or the gospels, they shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Now notice he specifically mentioned two periods of time. Now in this time, and then he talked about in the, in the age to come, in the time to come, eternal life. 
So two different time frames in this time now and in the time to come. So notice the hundredfold was promised in this time now. Not when you get to heaven. What are you going to do with a hundredfold on your giving in heaven? Amen. You're not going to need it in heaven. Does anybody need a hundredfold down here? Now, when Carol and I first started out, tenfold on our giving would not help us at all. It didn't help us at all. We were forced to believe for hundredfold. I remember there was a meeting called a number of years ago and uh, there was probably 25 ministers or so that were invited to come and uh, they wanted to address this hundredfold issue. And so myself and Brother Copeland and Jesse DePlantis, we all flew to this meeting together. And uh, I said to both of them, as we were flying up there, I said, I just intend to listen today. I'm not going to open my mouth. I, I'm just going to come prepared to listen. And they both said, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Let's just listen. So we got into that meeting. And once again, there were, there were a great number of, of Word of Faith ministers there representing the Word of Faith. And uh, the person who was emceeing the meeting said, uh, gentlemen, we want to address this issue about the hundredfold. Some of you are teaching that people are entitled to a hundredfold on their giving. And there was some discussion, and I just sat there and listened, listening. And then the discussion got deeper and deeper and deeper, and I'm still just listening. But after a while, I felt a Smith Wigglesworth coming on me. <laughs> Smith Wigglesworth was known when he heard something that didn't line up with a word to just stand up and say, stop him, Lord. He's charging the air with unbelief. And I'm trying to suppress Smith on the inside of me because <laughs> this is not my meeting. And I had said, I'm not going to open my mouth. I'm just going to listen. And so it just got deeper and deeper and deeper. And then finally, the man who was doing most of the talking, which had not been in the ministry as long as most of us had. You know, it's amazing to me, a novice tries to take over a meeting. I remember one time in another meeting that Brother Hagen called. We were all up in Tulsa. T.L. Osborne was there, Fred Price, John Osteen, myself, Kenneth Copeland, uh, a great number of, of Word of Faith ministers. And one guy who'd been in, an, in less time than all of us took over the whole thing and just did all the talking. And Brother Hagin sitting there just listening, just twiddling his thumbs. And then when the guy finally got through, Brother Hagin said, uh, I'm the one who called this meeting. Do you think it'd be okay if I said something? I thought, thank God. He finally shut the guy up, you know. Sometimes people that don't know much want to do all the talking. Moving right along. So in this meeting, the guy that's him seeing it had not been in the ministry as long as most of the rest of us. But he's the one who's decided to correct us all. So finally, he made this statement. In fact, let me back up a little bit. Now I won't tell that part. Anyway, he made this statement. He said, when Jesus said a hundredfold in this time now, it was just a metaphor. He didn't really mean that you're entitled to a hundredfold. It was just a metaphor, meaning a figure of speech. I couldn't take it anymore. I lifted my hand. Brother Jerry, would you like to say something? Yes, I would. I said, sir, would you mind telling me what a field full of metaphor looks like? He said, what? See, most of you didn't catch that either. I said, would you mind telling me what a field full of metaphor looks like? He said, I don't understand what you mean. I said, would you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 26? Hold your place there in Mark 10. Go to Genesis chapter 26 for a moment. Genesis chapter 26. 
Verse 1, and there was a famine in the land. Verse 2, and the Lord appeared unto him, Isaac, and said, Go not into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land. I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. And bless means empower to prosper, even in a famine. Even in a famine. Even in bad economy. When God promises to bless you, it makes no difference what's happening in the world around you. You will excel. You will rise above. You will prosper if you believe it. He said, I will bless thee and go, so on. In verse 6, and Isaac dwelt in Jorar. Verse 12, then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. I said, sir, tell me, please describe to me what a, a field full of metaphor looks like. That's not a figure of speech. It was an actual hundredfold on, on the seed that he sowed. In fact, so great that the Philistines envied him. You could tell where Isaac sowed and where the Philistines borderline was. When the Philistines looked over into Isaac's field, all they saw was a hundredfold crop. When they looked in their field, drought. So what does a field full of metaphor look like? That's not a metaphor, folks. It's not a metaphor. It was real. Amen. Go back to Mark chapter 10. And if it was real in Genesis 26, then it's real in Mark chapter 10. Got to have a little more enthusiasm here. Amen. Now, as I said, when Carol and I first started out, we didn't have a lot to give because I had business debts. We had personal debts. We're believing, out of, out of, uh, believing to get out of debt and we sold what we could. And sometimes it was, it was small, but we're believing like Jesus said, and we would decree, Lord, we're believing for a hundredfold on this seed. And as I said, tenfold didn't get us very far. 30-fold didn't get us very far. 60-fold didn't get us very far. 100-fold is what we needed. And many times we experienced it, 100-fold. So when somebody comes along and tells me that 100-fold doesn't work, you're too late. It's already worked many times. In fact, I'll give you another uh, testimony. And, and many of you have heard this before but uh, it's worthy of repeating. In 1981, while preaching in Charlotte, North Carolina with Brother Copeland, uh, on Thursday, after I got out of my session, Carol and I went to our hotel, and uh, she said, are you going to take a nap before we go into the service tonight? I said, no, I think I'm just going to uh, sit here in the living room and just relax. If you want to take a nap, go ahead and go to the bedroom, and I'll wake you up when it's time to to go to the service tonight. She said, if I don't get a nap, I don't believe I can keep my eyes open while Brother Copeland's preaching tonight. I said, well, go ahead and take a nap. And uh, she went in the bedroom, closed the door. I took my suit off, hung it up, put my robe on, and I sat on the sofa and just propped my feet up on the coffee table in front of me and put my hands behind my head and just closed my eyes, not to sleep, just, just to close my eyes to relax for a moment. And suddenly... The, the Shekinah glory filled the room. I'd never had it happen before. I didn't know it was going to happen. I didn't ask for it to happen. And the, the, the glory of the Lord filled that room to the point I couldn't even see the furniture anymore. And the Lord appeared to me. And he said, my people are in financial famine, just like what we read about in Genesis 26. He said, I'm going to reveal to you the keys that will bring them out and hold you responsible for telling them. And so I, I had a legal pad next to my sofa there, and I grabbed it to write down everything Jesus said to me. I completely filled a, a legal pad. Now it seemed like to me that it was there for hours, but it was just moments. And it led me to realize that Jesus can say more in a few moments than most preachers can in an entire lifetime. But I filled that notepad up and then he left. 
And Carolyn was awakened and came in there. And when she came in the room, she said, what's happening in here? I said, I've just experienced a, a, a visitation from the Lord. Now she didn't say, like most people would have said, what do he look like? She didn't say that. She said, what did he say? What he said was more important. And then I began to read those notes that I had taken from him. And uh, she said, are you going to tell Brother Copeland about this? I said, no. Uh, he and I have worked together long enough where he'll pick it up in the spirit. I won't have to tell him. So we went over to the meeting that night and we sat down on the front row next to Gloria and Charles and Peggy Cabs and Norval Hayes, uh, the other speakers in that conference. Brother Copeland got up, sang a couple of songs, and then he uh, told us to uh, open our Bibles, but didn't tell us where. And he tried to do that about three times and didn't tell us where. Finally, he closed his Bible, asked his associate, bring me a chair and set it right here by the podium. He said, Jerry, God visited you today. Come tell us what he said. So I came up to the platform and the podium, and I began to preach on what the Lord entitled me to call the message, Sowing in Famine. And I preached that message that night, and I'm telling you, we had such a miracle breakthrough. It was amazing. One of, the, one of the greatest financial breakthroughs that we had had up to that point. Now, before I went over there, the Lord said to me, he said, your ministry is experiencing financial famine. <clears throat> he said, I want you to apply <clears throat> these keys that I gave you and you set the example. And then he said this, and I will bless you just like I blessed Isaac. So I read over there in Genesis 26, where we just read, and it said a hundredfold in the same year. I said, Lord, this is October. He said, what difference does that make? You don't think I can bless you with a hundredfold in the same year? He said, be it unto thee according to thy faith. So I had 10 departments in my ministry, evangelism, Bible school, missions, television, and so on. And he said, I want you to write a check for $1,000 out of each department and sow it into Kenneth Copeland Ministries tonight. Carol and I were believing to build our, our home that we're in now. And so we took $1,000 out of our personal account. And some of those accounts, that was the last $1,000 I had. I mean, I, it wasn't a hot check. There was enough to cover the check. <laughs> And then, you know, maybe a few dollars left over. And uh, so uh, I, I, w I went over there and I thought maybe the Lord wanted me to do this privately back in the speaker's room. But when he called me up to preach this message, he said, after I got through preaching it, he said, do it now. So I said, Brother Copeland, come up here, if you would, please, and stand right there. And I said, I'm sowing in famine, just like. Isaac did. I said, this is $1,000 out of my evangelism, $1,000 out of Bible school, $1,000 out of aviation, $1,000 out of television. And I went right down through all 10 departments and then $1,000 out of our personal account, we're building our dream home. And he prayed over it. And then I challenged the people to do likewise. Okay. The next week I was in Tulsa with Brother Hagan. Brother Hagan was not in that meeting. And the opening night, Brother Hagan was preaching. He said, Brother Jerry, come up here. The Lord just told me to do something. I'm about to sow one of the largest seeds I've ever sown. So I came up to the uh, podium or to the platform. He said, uh, the Lord just told me to give you my airplane. I'm giving it to you. Amen. Amen. Now, I had sold $1,000 out of my aviation account, believing for my next airplane. And that airplane at that time was worth a quarter of a million dollars. I sold a thousand, reaped $250,000 in value. I'd call that a, a, a good return, wouldn't you? The next night, the same meeting, a couple came up to me and said, Brother Jerry, when we left Canada, 
the Lord told us to bring you a check for your television ministry, and here's a check for $100,000. I sold a thousand out of television, and I reaped a hundred thousand. That's a pretty good return, isn't it? And it went on and on and on, and by the end of December 31st, 1981, we had received a hundred times on every one of those seeds that we sowed. Amen. Now, once again, when people tell me that's just a metaphor, well, I was flying a metaphor. I was preaching to the nations on a metaphor. I had Bible school students coming to a metaphor school. We live in a metaphor house. It's too late, folks. Too late. I said, it's too late. Jesus said, be it unto thee according to thy faith. If, if your faith can believe for tenfold, go for it. If your faith can believe for thirtyfold, go for it. If your faith can believe for sixtyfold, go for it. If your faith can believe for a hundredfold, go for it. Amen. Hallelujah. You will get what you believe for. Now, I learned a long time ago. I've looked at this. I've studied this. This is my, not my first rodeo preaching this. Hallelujah. I've looked in all, I, I don't know how many translations studying this. And most of them will use the word hundred times or the phrase hundred times rather than hundredfold. Really doesn't make that much difference. What the Lord told me was this. He said, when you see hundredfold, you begin to say maximum results. Hundredfold represents maximum results. Okay? So I challenge you, when you sow, rather than go around saying, I'm believing for a hundredfold, that's fine too. But if I were you, I would say, I'm believing for maximum results. Amen. How many of you would like to have maximum results? Amen. Now, maximum results. And don't forget, in this time. In this time. Boy, I'm telling you what, in this time we're living right now would be a great time to have maximum results. Wouldn't you agree? So up to now, I've experienced hundredfold occasionally. Not every time. In fact, that man in that meeting, he said, well, Brother Jerry, do you mean to tell me you've experienced a hundredfold on every seed you've sown? I said, not yet, but it's not over. When we got in an airplane to fly home, Jesse said, I thought you wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> Brother Colton said, I'm glad you spoke up. You represented us well. Now, I haven't received a hundredfold on every seed I've sown, but I haven't given up. Yes. It's not over yet. Yes. I'm still in this time. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you could really use a hundred times what you sow? Yes. Well, we all could, praise God. So, why not go for it? If your faith is at that level, then go for it. If it's not, keep feeding on the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. I, I, I like to just go back and read the story of Isaac over and over and over. In a famine, he sowed, a hundred, he sowed his seed and received in the same year a hundredfold. Now, after that meeting in Charlotte, uh, Brother Copeland got up and he told Terry Pearsons, uh, who was directing his television ministry at that time, he said, Terry, get this message Jerry just preached on my television broadcast as quickly as you possibly can. Back then he was just doing Sunday services uh, on television. So in a matter of just a few weeks, she got it on uh, television on a Sunday. It aired on a Sunday, and on Monday morning, I get a call from Tulsa, Oklahoma, from Ruth Rooks, who was Brother Oral Roberts' personal secretary. And she said, Brother Roberts and Evelyn were watching Kenneth Copeland's broadcast yesterday in their home and saw you preaching, and Brother Roberts wants you in his office this morning. Can I tell him to expect you here? 
I thought, well, who tells old Roberts no? <laughs> and at that point, I had not met the man. And he's watching me preach on sowing and famine. So we got in the airplane and flew to Tulsa. And I actually didn't even know where his office was. I'd been on the campus before, but I didn't know what building his office was in. And I asked a couple of students if they could direct me to Dr. Roberts' office. They said, oh, we're not allowed to go there. That's the Vatican. We can't go there. <laughs> and I said, well, does anybody know how to tell me to get there? He's expecting me. So somebody was brave enough to take me to the building and uh, said, get on that elevator and go to the sixth floor. So went up to the sixth floor and opened up into Ruth Rook's office. I said, uh, Miss Rooks, I'm Jerry Savelle. She said, Brother Roberts is expecting you. She got on the intercom and said, uh, Brother Roberts, Jerry Savelle is in my office. So when he came out, she pointed me to his office, said he'd be coming through those doors. When he came out, he was a lot taller than what I thought he was. He's a tall man. And he, he went like this. And it looked like to me, his arm went from one end of that room to the other end. <laughs> he said, come here, my brother. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. I actually turned around to see who else came in the room. I, I, that, that, that shocked me. And there was nobody but me and Ruth. I said, are you talking to me? He said, I'm talking to you. I said, you've been wanting to meet me for a long time? I said, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. He said, I heard years ago that you heard the call of God watching me on television when you were a young boy. And while I was watching you on Brother Copeland's broadcast yesterday, I told Evelyn, it's time for us to develop a relationship with this young man. He said, come here. So I walked up to him and I didn't know how close he wanted me. I was about this far, he said, come here. I walked up a little closer. He said, come here. <laughs> and then he grabbed me in his arms and pulled me up against his chest and started prophesying over me. And then he, he said, come into my office. And so there was a chalkboard and he handed me a piece of chalk. He said, now, I want you to preach that message that you preached on Brother Copeland's broadcast to me. I want you to preach it just like you did on that broadcast. First, I want you to write the three main scriptures you talked about and the three main points that Jesus gave you. He said, if I don't understand something, I'll stop you, make you repeat it. If I'm not sure that's what it meant, then I'll correct you. He said, when I get through, you will know whether you've heard from God or not. <laughs> he said, begin. <laughs> and he said, this is an oral exam. Amen. So I wrote my three verses and I wrote the three points that the Lord gave me. And then I started preaching it. And he stopped me several times, said, say that again. And then he'd say, how do you know that's what he meant? And I mean, I, I had to be, I had to know that I knew <laughs> or, or I'm on my way out the door. He's he, he would have said, I'm sorry, brother Seville, uh, but you just didn't hear God after all. He kept me for six hours, six hours. And then he stood up. He said, you've heard from God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, now, are you going to put this in a book? I said, I plan to. He said, you better hurry up because I'm going to put it in a book and I'm not going to tell anybody where I got it. So I came home and I told my publication department, get this message in a book as quick as you can because Oral Roberts is going to do it too. We called it sowing and famine. He called it attack your lack. Same message. In fact, Richard Roberts told me that when I left that day, I hadn't met Richard at that time either, that his daddy preached that message in chapel and Richard was the editor of it. He said, Daddy told me to get that book out as quick as I could. We got this book out faster than any book we have ever written. <laughs> Sowing in famine. This book has gone around the world many, many times. It's been reprinted I don't know how many times. Amen. Sowing in famine. Who'd like to have it? <laughs> 
I was gonna say, Ryan, you work in the publication department. You can get one anytime you want. <laughs> that book, I preached that message in 1982 in Johannesburg, South Africa. And Rodney Howard Brown tells me, because that's when I met him, when he was just a farm boy in South Africa. And he tells me he was in that meeting that night when I preached that. And he and Adonica, his wife, they sowed everything they had. And that's the message that got them to America. And he is one of the greatest sowers I have ever met as a result of him learning that lesson from sowing in famine. If you haven't read that book, it's in the, it's in the uh, book room. I encourage you to get it. It talks about maximum results. God wants us to have maximum results. Amen. Because we need it today. Everything's gone up. You know, we just, we just overhauled two engines on our airplane. Used to cost $350,000 an engine. You know what it costs today? $750,000 an engine. I need maximum results. Everything's gone up. Everything's gone up. Do you think Jesus knew that was coming? <laughs> Nothing catches him by surprise. Everything we do is open and naked unto him. Amen. And who knows where it's going to go in another year. And it really doesn't make any difference who's in office. I mean, it makes a difference to me. But Jesus, or, or the Spirit of God told Paul, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. So they're coming. Whether we like it or not, they're coming. That's the reason why Jesus wants you and I to stretch our faith and believe for maximum results. Hallelujah. So that we're not hindered. So that we rise up when others are still down. That we're excelling. Amen. That we're increasing, that we're multiplying, regardless of what's happening around us. And the biggest thing about it is, it's not just so we can live better lives, it's so that we can invest bigger funds into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And invest in other people's lives. Amen. Blessed to be a blessing. That's what it's all about. Amen. So here's the word the Lord gave me for 2023. And we're going to put it up on the board here. 2023, the year of the maximum, the highest level attainable. The year of the maximum, the highest level attainable. Now we're going to make little cards for everybody and we'll give them out uh, here before long so that you can carry that with you. Keep the vision before you. I want to encourage every one of you, not only you that are in the auditorium, but everybody that's watching by uh, internet and, and, and uh, social media and so forth. Dare to stretch your faith for maximum results and the highest level attainable. Can you say amen? amen. Now, back in 1978, Charles Capps was one of the speakers in the uh, Full Gospel Businessmen International Convention in Honolulu, Hawaii. And one night, the, the Spirit of God came on him and he gave this prophetic utterance. Financial inversion shall increase. The economy shall go up and down, but those who learn to walk in the Word let me put my glasses on so I can see this clearly. But those who learn to walk in the word, they shall see prosperity come forth in a way that men have not seen in the past. Yes, there is coming a financial inversion in the world system. It's been held in reservoirs by wicked men, but the end is nigh. Those reservoirs shall be tapped and shall be drained for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will see things you've never dreamed would come to pass. God has planned a wealth transfer and it will come to pass just like he said it would. 
Now, there, that, that's not the end of that prophecy. It was quite lengthy, but that was the, the gist of it. A financial inversion. That's one of the ways that maximum results and the highest level attainable will be achieved in our lives. Amen. Amen. I experienced this financial ver inversion uh, in the early days of my ministry before I even moved to, to Fort Worth. I was in the uh, military with a man that uh, his family were quite wealthy in, in Shreveport, Louisiana. They owned a lot of businesses. And he was just a, a sinner. And uh, uh, I would witness to him from time to time. And uh, he, he didn't really want to hear it. But then he was interested in what I was doing in the streets. I was, I was ministering to drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and so forth and going to the jails. And, and uh, every time I'd see him, he'd say, well, what's happening in your ministry? And I'd tell him. And he was, he was really captivated by it. He wanted to hear it. And I'd say, well, Bob, why don't you receive the Lord? He said, no, nah, I, I, don't, I don't want that religious stuff. I said, no, I'm not religious. I'm talking about a relationship. No, that's, that's okay for you, but I, I'm a, I, I don't want it. So one day uh, he asked me how I, how I was funding all of this. I said, well, I just trust God. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, um, you know, the Bible says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking the other, running over. And, and I, 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 I give and I trust God to give me the return on it. He said, does it happen? I said, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm not wealthy by any means uh, and I'm still believing to pay off my business debts so that I don't have that burden on my ministry, you know. But I said, it, it puts food on the table, you know, puts gas in the car. And so he would ask me every time I'd see him, what are you doing now? How's it going? So one day I get a call and he says, can you come to my office? I said, well, I'm not sure where your office is. So he told me and I went to his office. When I walked in the room, his secretary uh, there in the lobby, she let him know that I was in her office. So he came out. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. I love it when people say, I don't know why I'm doing this. I know I'm about to experience some favor. And he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. But he said, I, I feel like I'm supposed to give you some money. He said, here. And he reached in his pocket and took cash out of both pockets and put it in my hands. And then he went back in his office and brought back some more he had in his briefcase. And then he went back in the office and brought a check out for some more. Amen, amen. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. Do you know why I'm doing this? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> now, I had just read the scripture in Proverbs just a few days before that. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So I said, yes, I know why you're doing this. He said, why? I said, well, the Bible says the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I'm the just, you're the sinner. He said, that's in the Bible? I said, yeah. You want me to, I, had, I had a Bible, a little small Bible. With me. I said, you want me to read it to you? Yeah. And I read it. The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. I said, Bob, if you don't get saved, I'm going to wind up with everything you got. <laughs> he said, dear God. He got down on his knees and said, pray. <laughs> I led him to the Lord. I ran into Bob about maybe 10 years ago. I was driving to Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I stopped in Shreveport at a Cracker Barrel to have lunch before I went home. And I'm sitting there in the Cracker Barrel on Interstate 20. And somebody come up and tapped me on the shoulder. I turned and it was Bob. He said, do you remember me? I said, of course I remember you. He said, you know, uh, I remember when you prayed for me in my, in my office. And he said, I got saved that day. And he said, you know, I've been a deacon in our church ever since. He said, my life has never been the same. I said, Bob, do you realize you were my first partner in my ministry? <laughs> you, were the, you were the first person who gave me uh, 
apparently everything you had in your pocket and everything you had in your briefcase. And he said, well, it sure paid off because God has blessed my business big time. Amen. The wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. Now the Amplified Bible says, and eventually it will come into their hands. Eventually. Now that was written a long, long time ago. Do you suppose we might be closer to eventually? I remember, how many of you remember years ago when Brother Roberts was believing for all that money and the press got on him and said, you know, or Robert said, God's going to kill him if he didn't raise this amount of money. Well, that money was for, he was believing for the money to pay off the debt of the doctors and nurses that had graduated from ORU. And he wanted to get them on the mission field. And one of the prototypes that he was using was a clinic that I was building in, in Kenya. Carlin Wade, we sent them over there to oversee that project. And they were, he was believing for $8 million so he could pay the debts off of the student loans so that these doctors and nurses could go to the mission field. They, they, they couldn't go and because he's trying to pay off student loans. So he was believing for the $8 million so he could pay the debts off and get them on the mission field. So the press jumped on it and they just come up with all kind of lies. So I was, I was on his board and uh, he called me one day and said, I want you to come up to Tulsa and I want you to join me in the prayer tower. We need to believe God for the last million that we need. He said, and this last million has been like pulling teeth. He said, I want you to come and join me in the prayer tower. So I flew to Tulsa. When I got to the prayer tower, Brother Roberts was in there and another man that I didn't know. And so Brother Roberts introduced me to him. He said, uh, Jerry, uh, this is so-and-so. He's from Florida and he owns a dog racing track. And said, he was watching me on TV a few days ago. And I talked about how that we needed one mil more, the last $1 million so we could pay these student loan debts off. And he said, he told me that he turned to his wife and said, why aren't the Christians paying this debt off for him? So he can get these doctors on the mission field. He said, we're not even Christians. Why aren't, why aren't the Christians doing this for him? He said, I'm going to go take care of that. So he called and found out how he could arrange to meet Oral Roberts. Now he owned dog racing tracks. Okay. So he arranged to meet Brother Roberts up in the prayer tower. And so he's, Brother Roberts is telling me this story. And then he showed me that last check for $1 million. Said, this man just brought me the last million dollars. And so we prayed over him. And then the man said, well, I've got to get back home. Now, that's not even a born again man. Okay. He said, I got to get back home. So the man left and Brother Roberts, I said, well, Brother Roberts, since we got the last million, I guess I can go on home. He said, I guess you can. And so I started out the door and Brother Robert said, Jerry, be sure and pray for them dogs. <laughs> Amen. So I've been praying for them dogs ever since, you know. Now, isn't it amazing that a sinner heard from God? He was stirred while watching old Roberts on television to bring that last million so that they could get the doctors on the mission field. Amen. There's another example of the wealth of the sinner laid up for the just. Don't, don't say, well, I don't know how that could happen. Well, that's because you're not God. God has ways to make it happen. Years ago, how many of you are familiar with Miller Brewery on I-20? Years ago, I'd have to drive by Miller's Brewery every time I'd go to my office on Bolt Street down by Seminary South. And every time I'd drive by there, I'd roll the window down and I'd say, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. I roll my window up going to the office. On my way back home, wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. One day, my in-house accountant said, Brother Jerry, we just got a check from Miller's Brewery. It's a nice check. 
And at first I thought it might be somebody that worked there. And they just endorsed their check and sent it to the ministry. I said, no, it's directly from Miller's Brewery. And it was a nice check. Hallelujah. So I shouted louder the next time, you know. <laughs> now I went to a minister's meeting right after that happened. And I, I shared that story. And one preacher came up to me and said, Brother Savell, real religious, you didn't, you didn't keep that filthy lucre, did you? I said, I, I did keep that filthy lucre, and I cast all them devils off of it and spent it on the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. All you got to do is cast the devils off filthy lucre, and it's not filthy anymore, praise God. Amen. Now listen to this. See, this is one of the ways that God has arranged for you and I to experience maximum results and the highest level attainable in the last days. Listen to this. In Psalm 49.10 from the Passion Translation, the brightest and best, along with the foolish and senseless, God sees they all will die one day, leaving their wealth to others. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. Vanity means pride, conceit, arrogance, vain pursuit. The Amplified Bible says, wealth won unjustly will dwindle away. Now, where is it going to go? The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Amen. The message translation says, ill-gotten wealth ends up with good people. You missed a wonderful opportunity to say, that's me he's talking about. <laughs> Ill-gotten wealth ends up with good people. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The Passion Translation says, it's treasured up for the righteous. The Amplified Bible says, the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Amen. Now go with me to the book of James for a moment. James chapter five. Let's not limit God just because we don't understand how he could do it. You know, I, there's a lot of things I don't understand. Does everybody in here understand the laws of aerodynamics? I mean, have you ever been on an airplane? You got on that thing and not understand? Wow. You must have some faith. What would happen if when we boarded an airplane, they gave you an exam? I want you to tell me why this airplane can fly. What are the laws? And if you can't tell them, you can't fly. Get off. You do a lot of things that you don't understand. Duh. Huh? You may not understand how God can take a sinner and have him invest in your life. You don't have to understand it. All you got to do is believe it. <laughs> Simply because God said it. Amen. How can God do that? I'm not God, but he has his ways. Hallelujah. Now, James chapter five, let's begin in verse one. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be witness against you and she will eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Notice, you have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now that could have a twofold meaning. It means, it could mean you've heaped all this up, but that's coming to an end. And it also could mean you've heaped it all up for the purpose of last day's ministry. 
It'll be used for the gospel's sake in the last days. Okay, now listen. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Saboeth. And that is not Sabbath, that's Saboeth. Saboeth means host, talking about the angels, okay? Now notice there are two cries mentioned in this verse. Two cries. Number one, the cry of the hire or the wages. And then the cry of the people that it rightfully belongs to. Two cries. Wages are crying and the people that it rightfully belongs to are crying. And we're not talking about tears of sorrow. We're talking about a command to be placed in the hands where it rightfully belongs. Now, look at it like this. How many of you are givers? Do you believe God wants you to have a return on your gift? Yes. Amen. Have, has everybody in here received harvest on every seed you've sown? Okay, then that is a violation of spiritual law, right? Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. That's spiritual law. And if we're not reaping on what we're sowing, that's a violation of spiritual law. Now, a lot of people, since they're not reaping on all that they've sown, then they just forget about it. They don't even think about it anymore. However, according to this, that harvest that belongs to you is crying out for you. And, and the people in whom it belongs to should be crying out for it. Well, how, Brother Jerry? Well, your harvest is saying, I want in the hands of the person that I rightfully belong to. You should be saying, I want my harvest. And if your harvest is crying out and the person that it rightfully belongs to is crying out, God is going to arrange a divine appointment. Hallelujah. Amen. I do this. Now you may think I'm nuts, but I'm a nut that's blessed. Sometimes I walk outside and I say, do you hear it? That's my harvest crying. It's crying. I did that. I did that with the Falcon 50 we're flying right now. Every time I landed at an airport where there was a Falcon 50, I would walk over to it and put my ear up on the nose. Are you my harvest? <laughs> now I'm not lusting after somebody else's property. I'm just, I'm just exercising my faith demonstrating that I'm endeavoring to hear the cry of my harvest. Amen. So the harvest is saying, let me go. Release me. I don't belong in the hands of the wicked. I belong in the hands of the righteous. That's what your harvest is saying. And you should be saying, I'm the one who rightfully is entitled to that harvest because I sowed the seed for it. And if you keep crying out for your harvest and your harvest keeps crying out for you, then once again, God is going to arrange a divine appointment and praise God, that divine appointment is going to produce maximum results and the highest level attainable. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. The message translation says that your harvest and you are crying out for judgment. Crying out for judgment. Judgment meaning discerning right from wrong, good from evil, and correcting it. In other words, God, I'm asking for justice here. My harvest is in the hands 
of someone that it doesn't belong to. I want justice. I'm calling for judgment. Amen? Crying out for judgment. Wealth, according to God's word, doesn't belong in the wicked's hands. It belongs in the righteous for the primary purpose of being able to finance the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is turning things around and he's making things right. Hallelujah. All right, now, let's, let's go back a moment. And I don't want to overlook some of these important notes. It's time to go for the maximum. I believe God is ready to take us higher and further than we've ever experienced before. Don't settle for just getting by. Go for the best that God has to offer. That's what he's telling us. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, go there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I want to begin in verse 6. <clears throat> and this is a story of maximum results. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Notice we're talking about maximum results. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when. Notice these verses are not saying if, it's when. Everybody say when. when. In other words, it's just a matter of time. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses, houses, I don't believe anybody ought to have more than one house. Well, you won't ever have to worry about it because you won't have more than one house. Houses. And when thou hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. In fact, there's another, there's another verse that says that God will arrange for you to have houses you did not build. Wells you did not dig. It very well could be that somebody's building your dream house right now. Yes. Thinking it's theirs and God's arranging for you to have it. Yes. Brother Jerry, you're a nut. No, I'm the nut that lives in a dream house. Yes. Huh? I've had God do that. I watched a man build a, a garage, a metal building, a warehouse down in Granbury next to property I own down there. And I told Carol, I said, that's what I need. I need that to put my boats in and put my jet skis in and all. And he got it built. And the next time I drove down there, he had a sign up, going to sell the, his house, the building, everything. I didn't want his house, but I, I wanted his building. And I had been confessing that, that God said that I will have houses that I did not build, wells that I did not dig. And that guy built my shop for me. Amen. And just in a matter of a couple of weeks, I was in it. Glory to God. So somebody could be right now building your dream house, thinking it's for them, and you wind up owning it. Folks, let's don't limit God. Let's don't limit God. Let's go up to a higher level. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, 
and all that thou hast is multiplied. Now you may not be into herds and flocks, but go ahead and accept all the rest of it. Yeah. Your gold and your silver is multiplied. All that you have is multiplied. Then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God that brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness when were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought and there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint who led thee in the wilderness uh, with manna which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end and thou say in thine heart my power and my might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, that it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Amen. So notice here, under the Old Testament, if they were obedient and obeyed what he said, they could achieve maximum results. Yes. And all they had to do was remember that it was the Lord, their God, that made it happen. Yes. That it wasn't the power of their own hands, their own might, their own ability. It was God who enabled them to accomplish this. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God, we have a better covenant founded upon better promises. Yes. If they could have maximum results under the Old Testament, we could have maximum results under the New Testament. Yes. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 10, says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. Yeah. The blessing has the potential of making a person rich. Psalm 5, 8 says, thy blessing is upon thy people. How many of you consider yourself one of God's people? Yeah. Then right there where you're sitting right now, listening to me, you have something on you that gives you the potential to become rich. Whether you ever tap into it or not, the potential is there. Amen. The potential is there because the blessing is on you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And don't be afraid of rich. Amen. Rich just means that your needs are met and now you can help others have their needs met. That's what rich is for. Amen. 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 So maximum results, the highest level attainable. That's what we're believing for in 2023. Yes. Now, before we close, I, I thought it was very interesting when I looked up the number 2023 in Strong's Concordance. And it was symbolic of a mountain or a peak a mountain or a peak. A peak means the highest level. That brings to mind the phrase peak performance. I don't think this is a coincidence that 2023 in Strong's Concordance is symbolic of a mountain or a peak, meaning that 2023 should be our year for peak performance. Yes. Maximum results. Yes. Highest level attainable. I do not believe that's a coincidence. Yes. Amen. Another way of saying it, being productive, highest level attainable, in the Bible, it's the word fruitful. And Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Yeah. Being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful would mean maximum results, highest level attainable. The Ben Campbell Johnson's biblical truth in today's language, a paraphrase translation, says it this way that your lifestyle will please God and your efforts will be productive. All your efforts will be productive. I noticed, I, I like the way he connected those two thoughts. 
that your lifestyle will please God and that all your efforts will be productive. Amen. Sounds like to me, when all of our efforts are productive, you're even pleasing God in a greater way. Amen. Think about it. Amen. When all of your efforts are productive, then that certainly would bring joy to the Lord. Amen. Yes. Joy to your heavenly father. Yes. Bring pleasure to him. The Bible says it is your father's good pleasure. Amen. So once again, maximum results and highest level attainable. John 15 verse five said, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit, much fruit. Much is a very great degree or an extent that is of great quantity. So we're talking about maximum results that you bear much fruit. Look at somebody and tell them, God wants you bearing much fruit. <laughs> maximum results, highest level attainable. So settle it once and for all in your own heart that just getting by has never been God's will or God's best for us. We are capable, have the potential of maximum results, highest level attainable. And I believe it's important to God that we go for it this year like never before. Amen. Mark chapter nine, verse 23. If thou canst believe that all things are possible to him that believeth. Go as high as your faith will take you. Amen. And, and don't criticize others if their faith is at a higher level and they're capable of believing more for much more than what you're capable of believing. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't get upset with people that their level of faith is higher than mine. It's, it's inspiring to me. When Carol and I first came into this, Gloria and Kenneth Copeland were, were our examples. They, they, they were ahead of us. They had seen things we hadn't seen. They'd experienced things we hadn't experienced. And, and what it said to us is, they're, they're human just like we are. You know, Brother Copeland puts on his slacks one leg at a time just like I do. You know, they're, they're just human. But they are humans that decided to trust God and believe what he said and do what he said and expect the results that he said they would get. And once we came over here and went to work with them and saw how that they applied the word and saw the results they got, then it was a great inspiration to us. And I would say someday my faith's going to get to that level. Well, when they got to that level, his had already gone to another level. His is always at another level. That's the reason I love being around him because he inspires me. Amen. That's the reason why I love being around Oral Roberts. His faith inspired me. Amen. So don't get upset if somebody is capable of believing for much more than what you're capable of. Just say, well, praise God. That proves it can be done. And I'm going to get my faith to that level. Hallelujah. Just keep feeding on the word of God. Just keep doing what the Bible says to do. And praise God. Your faith will grow. Paul said to the church in Thessalonica that your faith groweth exceedingly. So it can keep right on growing. In fact, you ought to be at a higher level by the end of next year than you are at this end of this year. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So all things are possible to him that believeth. The dictionary defines impossible as incapable of being done attained or fulfilled. Some people would say maximum results is impossible. Well, it might be to you, but not to everybody. Amen. Highest level attainable. That's impossible. It might be to you, but not to everybody. Amen. 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 So don't get upset if somebody is capable of, of reaching a higher level. Let it be an inspiration to you. Amen. Amen. Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hallelujah. Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 32, 17, that nothing 
is too hard for God. Amen. Nothing is too hard for God. So dare to believe it. Let's, let's determine that this year we are going for maximum results and the highest level attainable. Amen. How many of you are going to go with me? Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Hallelujah. I may not be there right now, but that's where I'm going. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, let's lift our hands. Let's thank God in advance for it. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, I pray over everyone within the sound of my voice that the word that I've shared today has been an inspiration to them. And if anybody might be struggling with it, then give them revelation, give them insight in, in endeavor to help them go to a higher level and refuse to stay as they are. It's never your best for us to stay as we are. Your word says, I will increase you more and more. Increase is what's in your heart for your people. And so we are ready to go there, Lord. We're ready to take the next step. We're ready to go to a higher place. And in the name of Jesus, it is our confession, and we will hold fast to it, that in 2023, we will experience maximum results in every area of our lives, and we will reach the highest level attainable. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. If you believe it, give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Is that your best shout? I said, is that your best shout? All right. Praise God. Amen.